subject now religion has divided many countries across the globe on the continent alone we've seen a rise in sectarian violence but south africa is known to have a great degree of tolerance when it comes to religion but just how tolerant are we really the deadly attack on a mosque outside durban earlier this week shocked many and the hawks believe it shows signs of extremism we chat this morning to muslim scholar professor farid isaac about how we can nurture tolerance uh, in south Africa and the globe over and whether we have always been in danger of sectarian tensions. A very good morning to you. Thank you so good much for coming to this you morning to you and delighted to be with you and your viewers. When we talk about religious tolerance, I, does it shock you that in 2018 we are still finding ways of how to be tolerant of other people's religions? Well, uh, yes and no. <clears throat> um, the one is uh, in terms of where our country has arrived at uh, the, the general spirit of generosity, uh, of pluralism, of openness, of respect for other people, um, of allowing different cultures and different languages and to flourish. This has been the hallmark of a post-apartheid South Africa. Um, but the truth is that, uh, that very often these things don't always seep down to all the levels and strata of our society. I mean, rural communities, for example, are much more uh, impatient or intolerant towards people inside their communities who behave differently or weirdly. Uh, whether this is your hairstyle or your sexual orientation or then what people in the city uh, do. But also the world itself uh, has become a bit more of an intolerant place. Uh, if you look at the intensity with which religious fundamentalism um, and American triumphalism is pushing its way in the world, a quick one, for example, it's one thing for one country to impose sanctions on another country, mm. uh, as Donald Trump recently has done. But then to come along and say, and any other country that deals with Iran, we will deal with that country as well. Ooh, 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 that's really a heightening of. And then if you look at, uh, at uh, the contestation for religion in, uh, in Africa, if you see how in the last uh, 20 years, um, the, uh, the more evangelical types, the Christian right-wing churches, uh, how they very aggressively moved into Africa, mm -hmm. kind of a recolonization. This on the one hand, and on the other hand, you've also seen the escalation of, uh, of Muslim extremism and making its inroads into Africa. And South Africa is a part of Africa. Mm. So these uh, religious contestations, the emergence of a much more rabid form of right-wing uh, evangelical Christianity that uh, aggressively demands that everybody be saved through Jesus Christ, and, um, and the influence of the international, uh, generally more kind of conservative type of Islam emerging uh, in South Africa, uh, all of these things, South Africa is not an island unto itself. Mm. So the one is the victories of, uh, of uh, 94, the other is we are a part of the rest of the world, we are connected, and those tendencies will impact on our country. You talk about a conservative <coughs> Islam, I think perhaps this yes. is a good opportunity for a quick lesson um, into Islam. Yes. Um, you have the Shia and the Sunni uh, within yes. Um, yes. Islam. Please yes. talk to us okay. uh, about that. Okay. These are the two major tendencies inside Islam. Mm -hmm. You have the Sunnis, and the Sunnis comprise about 80% of the Muslim world. You have the Shiites. The Shiites comprise uh, nearly the rest of the 20% of the Muslim world. Amongst the Sunnis, you get ordinary, so ordinary Sunnis who are just committed to their religion, wanting to live it out and so on. Uh, fanaticism uh, is not intrinsic to Sunnism. Mm -hmm. Neither is fanaticism intrinsic to Shiism. Uh, you, get, uh, um, uh, you get conservative strands of Sunnism, orthodox strands, more liberal or progressive strands in both of these religions. You get bad Sunnis and good Sunnis, you get bad Shiites and, bad, uh, uh, and good Shiites. As for what is really the difference, very quickly, historically, 
after the Prophet's death, um, the, Shia, the Sunnis recognize that uh, the process of the leadership of the community uh, went to a series of people that were appointed by the community. Um, the Shiites argue that no, um, the leadership of the Muslim community belonged to the Prophet's family. And so the Prophet's uh, nephew, Ali, he should have been the appropriate leader of the community. And there is a subtext that the leaders who were chosen by the Muslims when the Prophet died, that they were usurpers. So initially it was around this, and later as the two communities stay away from each other, the earlier historical political differences now merge into theological differences. These differences, Professor Isaac, how do they play themselves out within the broader Muslim community? Does it create some sort of rivalry? Yes, of course. <clears throat> uh, so amongst the larger Muslim community, there are certain countries today that are d predominantly Sunni, and there are some countries that are predominantly Shia. Some of these countries are also involved in political contestations regionally where they are located. And then connected to these political contestations, there's also kind of contestations for the heart and the souls of the larger global Muslim community. So very quickly, the Sunni world, <clears throat> um, there are three axes that compete with each other most of the time. There is Saudi Arabia, which houses the two sacred cities of Islam, Mecca, where the Prophet was born and where this place of pilgrimage is, and Medina, where the Prophet is buried. There, the Saudis are the main honchos. Okay, um, so you've got the Saudis, and there are Sunnis. Around the Saudis are some of the Gulf countries. The Saudis are now in a very, very serious, in a tight relationship with the United States on the one hand and Israel on the other, which sets them apart from the vast majority of the Muslim world, including the Sunni world. But the Saudis, they're still at it. They still think that they ought to be providing guidance to the whole Muslim world. The other interesting thing about the Saudis is the Saud Saudi Arabia is the homeland of Wahhabi Islam. And it is this very austere, harsh version of Sunni Islam that has theologically provided the basis for much of uh, the terrorism that we have seen uh, in the world uh, from the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, um, and Al-Shabaab, that is the Saudis. Two other axes. Turkey, the seat of the Ottoman Empire for centuries, they're trying to kind of re through Erdogan, try, but Turkey is also Sunni. They're trying to kind of re-establish their authority a bit more gently mm. over the rest of the world, mm. not so gently inside Turkey. Mm. Then one last one, Iran. Iran is the heart of Shiite Islam. And since the Islamic Revolution in 1978, that toppled a United States installed regime inside Iran, Iran has been at odds with the United States, much of the Western world. Iran, there was a lot of sympathy in the Muslim world for that revolution, mm -hmm. and a number of people also found Shiism as attractive. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it is now Iran pitted against Saudi Arabia, and inside the Muslim diaspora, like South Africa, there has been a growth of Iranian-supported Shiite Muslim communities. Not Iranian-funded, Iranian, -funded, Iranian supported. and now Iranian-supported. And now there are Sunni-Shi tensions inside the Muslim community. Let's pause it a little bit. I'd like us to come back and talk about extremism. Uh, thank you very much for that context. I'm joined in studio by a, a Muslim scholar professor, Dr. Farid Isaac. We continue this conversation after the break. Do